wherever you are and whenever you are. Welcome, good souls of the planet and beyond to Paranormal Now. I'm Alan B. Smith. Join us as we traverse the cosmic highway of paranormal portals and tantalizing turnoffs. Our guest tonight is Ket Thorvaldson to share with you her fascinating, fascinating story. One that may be hard to believe for many of the listeners out there. However, her Close Encounters story and the evidence that she has presented to go along with it, very personal evidence and story, is, is well, it, it can alter the, the paradigm of your thought on all of these subjects, I think. Well, we'll find out in just a little bit. Uh, please share your thoughts and experiences with us during or after the show on Facebook, facebook.com slash Paranormal Now Radio, Twitter at Paranormal underscore now. And uh, of course, join us in the KGRA chat room where you can pose your questions, join the conversation, and uh, get involved with the KGRA family. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll keep an eye. I'll do my best to see, see your questions there as we go as well. I'm, I'm not always on top of it. Um, but if I'm not there, everyone else in the chat room, it's a great group of people. So if you're new, uh, go say hello. Check them out. Uh, also, if you could take a moment, check out my YouTube channel called Paranormal Pop. Please go to YouTube, youtube.com slash Paranormal Pop. Plus, press the subscribe and alarm notification bell. Like, comment down below, share the content. I'm trying my best to get this up to 500 subscribers uh, by June. So we have a little bit of a ways to go, but I believe that with your help, we can absolutely, absolutely do that. Um, so fingers are crossed here. The Paranormal Radio app lines are open tonight in the second hour. Just call 85 85- KGRA live. That's 855 472 5483 for the Paranormal Radio app hotline. Listen to your cue to call in. We'll bring you on and then you go ahead, ask the questions away for myself or the guest. Ket Thorvaldsen was born in Drama, Norway in 1969. She had her first close encounter when she was only three years old, during which she met one of the small alien, quote, greys. She was 29 years old when she had her third close encounter. She was alone in a very isolated cabin on Gold Mountain where she had gone to work on her book. The morning after the encounter, she woke to find several strange sharp-edged marks on her right eyelid. In January 2016, it was suggested that she should check to see if she had any implants. In her, only to find a very unusual magnetic occurrence. She has now written a book entitled A Hybrid Story, where she tells the story of her life. This includes not only her close encounters, but also her spiritual journey, which includes poltergeists, spiritual helpers from the other side, past lives, and the effect they have on today's life, and helping the police with a murder inquiry in Norway. That's, that's pretty interesting. Uh, she will complete her next book in 2020 concerning a new type of physics, where she will cover cosmology, quantum physics, astrophysics, and it's called The Creation, where physics and consciousness meet. Her website is ketthorvaldsen.com. That's K-A-T-E-T-H-O-R-V-A-L-D-S-E-N.com. Ket, welcome. Hi there. Nice to be there. Thank you for coming on. So you, your experience is... Um, it includes a wide breadth of what would be considered ufology and the paranormal. Yeah, oh. you can say so. <laughs> right. So <clears throat> before we dive into that, I have to ask you, are you more of a coffee person or a tea person? I'm a tea person, so I just made I just brewed myself a big cup of tea here, so I'm ready. Okay, nice. Yeah, I, I made myself a nice strong cup of espresso to get us going tonight because I'm, so, <laughs> I'm really excited. I'm not really sure where where to start. So before you actually tell us about the close encounters with these ETs, can you tell us a little bit about your your being raised, your childhood, and the belief systems that you grew up with? Well, um, well, 
I must say that our family is not a Christian family. It's more like a what you will say a normal, typical normal Norwegian family. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, most of the Norwegians we are standing in the church system, but we are never going there unless we are getting married or being buried or <laughs> yeah, having a kid. So beside that, most of the time we are not in the church. No. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah. And so spirituality, was that a part of your everyday life in any way? Uh, not so much when I was growing up, no. It wasn't. So then it must have been a kind of a shock then to have these paranormal experiences. Well, not to that either, because they were coming uh, a little bit at a time, and uh, it was just like a part of your daily life, sort of. You were, so I guess when you're young, you're much more open, so in a sense you were conditioned. Yeah, uh, as I said, most of my life I have been experiencing people that are, are dead, that have been coming through, walking around in a house, yeah. and yeah, things like that. And how, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, another day in the life. Um, yep. how, how early did that start when you, were, when you had those sort of experiences? Uh, when I, if you think about the paranormal things, um, I think since I was around... Let me see. Eight, nine, nine years old or something. Okay. And I, I'm not familiar with uh, Norwegian mythology. So, I, but one wonders whenever a paranormal experience does occur to somebody, we, we look to our local folklore or what we've heard. Uh, did you do, you do that yourself? Did you have something that you uh, could compare your experiences to or look to for answers? No, I couldn't. So when I look when, when when I'm looking back on my yeah. folklore, that would be the old Vikings and things like that. And uh, no, I can't say that I com- can compare them. No, you can't compare Vikings with ghosts. Got it? No, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> or or the ghosts of a Viking, I suppose. Um, well, the, the the ghosts that was going through our houses or following us, they were more up to date. They were not that old as the Vikings. They're okay, upgraded. Yeah, 2.0 ghosts. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so what was the, the actual encounter experience that, that you had when you were three years old with these beings? Well, it was actually quite nice experience for me because, um, well, th- this first one happened when it was very close up to Christmas time. And my mother, she has told me that Santa Claus would be coming soon. Mm-hmm. And, um, of course, kids, they're always looking forward to Santa who is coming because he's bringing presents. So, but the thing is that one night he was, she was putting me to bed and I had this big crib that was standing in the bedroom, but I wasn't tired. So I remember I was standing in that crib and I was looking at our huge bedroom windows. Yeah. Uh, for how long I was standing like that, I don't know. But suddenly something happened on the left wall from my bed. It was like becoming like a little bit blurry. Mm-hmm. And out from this was this little gray creature coming. He did not walk. He was more like gliding up in front of my crib. And he was just a little bit taller than me. Not much. I guess that around 120 centimeters or something. I'm not sure what that will be in inches, but in centimeters, around 100, 170 centimeters, I think. And, of course, I was two years old. So I saw this creature standing in front of me, and I was starting blah, 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 trying to talk to him and get some response, but he didn't answer me back. And very quickly, un- I understood that he was communicating to me through his mind. Mm-hmm. So uh, the, the thing that he did, he was just giving me the feeling that he was there to see if I was okay. And then he was gliding the same way he came out through the wall on the left side. And in the next moment, I saw this one here together, together with one more inside of a craft. And they were hanging outside of my window. I was living on the second floor. So there was no street cars or anything light like that. So this was hanging outside the window, outside the balcony. And then it took off. And of course, in my little head, I was thinking, oh, yeah, Santa Claus was coming. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I was sure Santa Claus was, was the one that was there. Did, and, did, um, did you not have yeah. an idea of what Santa Claus looked like at that point? No, I, I didn't think that much. For in, in my head, that was Santa. So, um, well, you were. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And one week later, my mother, she put me on her arm and she was bringing me to the TV room and I was going to meet Santa. And of course, the guy that was sitting in my TV room, he has 
this red suit, false beard, and a plastic face, and I was terrified. So I was screaming my head off, and I was so angry at the same time because that was not my Santa Claus. And of course, they was wondering big time why I, why this was not my Santa Claus. And then, of course, I had to explain what my Santa Claus looked like. And my mother, she was very soon saying that, okay, we are not going to talk about that anymore. And of course, back in those days, I didn't know why, but later I do know. I love the fact that you were more terrified of the Santa Claus costume than an actual extraterrestrial. Yeah. <laughs> So the, the the thing was that we uh, in my mother's family, my mother has seen them, my grandfather has seen them, and some uh, some of the aunties that I know of have seen them, but uh, I don't know about anyone that has seen them on my father's side. Uh-huh. So then I understood why my mother wants me to yeah not say anything. So so it's a ma- a maternal phenomenon. What a ma- on the maternal side of your family only. Yeah, it was on my mother's side only. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So, did did any of them report the same experience you had, being that it was something pleasant rather than a negative experience? Well, we didn't talk about it that much when when I was at at that age. Uh huh. Or I, I was actually adult before we were starting to talking serious about these things. Hmm. So. Um, well, what, what my grandfather and my aunties, that for me, the only thing that I know about them that was that they were seeing the cigar kind of shaped crafts yeah. that was coming over. But my mother, she has seen them uh, close up. And she was, the last thing she, she remembered was that she was holding up her hand in front of her and say, no step further. And then she that's all she remember. Did it communicate anything specific to you? When I was three years old, there it was just the feeling that they were there to see if I was okay. And that was it. Okay, so you got the sense that were they healers or were they just inspectors? And well, back in those days, I didn't think about anything that uh, at all. I was just thinking that they were nice of them to see if I was okay. Yeah, and that's what stuck with you. Yeah. Okay, so after that experience, did did it have any impact on you? Um, behaviorally, or did you just sort of went on with the rest of your childhood? Well, I continue in the same way up till I was around 10 years old, because then I had my second close encounter. And of course, that one changed me a little bit more. Uh huh. And by then, you were already having paranormal experiences. Yeah. We, uh, in the house that we were living in, we moved to another place that is called Konru. It's not that far away from the first place. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, there was this gray kind of shadow, especially that she liked to follow my mother a lot. And uh, sometimes I remember she said to it once that, okay, I don't care if you are there, you you just stay there if you want. And then yeah. then you, after that, a little bit later, then you actually you heard the door was opening and the next door to the front of the house was also opening and this thing was going out and that was the last time we saw it. So... <laughs> But so. this being the category of, I don't know if you're familiar with Heidi Hollis and her work, but would it be like a shadow person? Does it fit into that to that camp? No, I'm not sure. I, I don't don't think that we were looking too much into it yeah. because that that one there was quite innocent. Right. So that okay. So here's the thing: when when someone has a paranormal experience, right now, if if something crosses your path. And it's not normal, it's not everyday, it's it's not seemingly earthly or conventionally explained. I think a lot of people get scared just because of that, Um, not necessarily because that thing is evil per se, right? So if in your experience, is there a way to tell the difference between just your, just an instinctual fear? Yeah, yeah. And, you, 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 if when it comes to the paranormal side, you, you will actually feel feel very good if it's uh, something bad or if it's yeah more neutral. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you, you, you just know it instinctively. Yeah, are you able to when you were ten years old? Were you able to talk about this second ET encounter? And, and I'm saying ET is that is that what you're going with? 
Yeah, that was uh, that was that was my close encounter number two. Yes, mm-hmm. I was actually living a very how to say it. Um, I stayed away from most of the other kids in school for a long time. I was trying to fit in, but I was always different, mm-hmm. and I could never put my finger on what made me different from the others, but I was always different in some way or another. So I never, I wasn't able to get a part of the group, so to speak. So I I was becoming much of a loner. So I remember that I was uh, a lot of times when my mother and my sister went to bed for the night, I crawled up on the rooftop and I was sitting there on the roof, looking at the stars and the moon at night and wishing for something to come back down here and pick me up and bring me home because this was not my place. Uh, It was very lonely. It was very sad. Mm. And uh, one night, the last thing I remember was that was this bright light over my head. And the next thing was that I was waking up in the morning in my bed, not to remember how I was getting there. And trust me, you are not climbing off the roof in in your sleep. Mm. So (laughs) that would be a good, good, yeah, almost impossible to do that. So, yeah. I guess I got some help. But the thing was that normally kids, when they are, especially girls, when they are 10 years old and living in a neighborhood with full of horses, for me, I was living, breeding, and talking horses most of the time. And now I didn't talk about the horses anymore. I not even drew them. I was starting to draw these little gray guys with the bald head and the big black eyes and start talking about other solar systems and planets. And, of course, I remember the kids in school, they thought that, okay, perhaps we have been driving her too far with our bullying or things like that because they actually stopped bullying. They stopped bullying? Yeah, they stopped bullying me when I, wa- when I was actually giving them a good reason to even do it more. They stopped. That's really odd. What, what do you think it explains that? Well, I guess that perhaps they were a little bit shocked. Perhaps they didn't know where to put me. Yeah. <laughs> You mentioned that you felt out of place. I think all of us at some point in our lives, especially our childhood, we we feel out of place, but uh, some of us more than others, and uh, especially those who have experienced, you know, being picked on and bullied, uh, you know, I wonder, you know, how much a percentage of the paranormal community can relate to that, you know, just feel like outsiders do you, th- do you think it's a large percentage of us i think that there's a large percentage yes yeah absolutely and then we draw do you think that pushes us towards the paranormal no no i don't think so uh, the, the paranormal is there all around us all the time anyway mm. but uh, of course it's a difference difference between us is how open we are to see them or feel them right right and you were innately open to that. I, I personally, I do not, I do not have any desire <laughs> to to have an encounter with a ghost or chupacabra, um, you know, or what have you. Uh, well, it, it's not, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a bad thing. I, actually, a lot of times it's a quite nice thing to to experience. Well, I've had, had odd experiences, and. Um, and and that's that's enough for me. I've, you know, I I, <laughs> I feel like you can be open without being too open. Does that make sense? Yeah, it it, it makes it makes sense. Yeah. And but what I, I also feel, but I also think that the more you know and the more relaxed you are in yourself, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of the things that you are are actually experiencing, if you don't um, if you don't react with fear, yeah. then you are more open to perhaps understand who is coming back to visit you or is there just an echo from the old house or yeah, it's, it's, it's easier to see the difference. Right. So having your grounding being, being centered. Absolutely. After your first experience, was that something that came over you, that sense of, of, um, of meaning at all or feeling grounded? Uh, what do you mean now? After I had my close encounter number two, you mean, or yes? What? Mm-hmm. Well, I can't say that I was thinking that much about it when I was ten years old. Uh, for me, it was more like that. I was, I was trying my best to tell the story or tell the information that I suddenly had. Mm-hmm. But of course, when no one is, or well, well, most of the people they are not listening to you. 
it don't take long before you're going back to your normal life again. Do you not remember more of what happened after they took you? No, I actually, I had to go through a hypnosis when I was 30, then I remembered. And what, what happened? Well, the thing, um, they took me up to the ship, and, like to beam me up, Scotty. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> kind of thing, uh, yeah. Um, as I said, I saw this bright light, and in the next moment I was inside this ship, and I was lying on some kind of table and having several of them around me. And, um, yeah, I guess I got something stuck up in my nose and my ears back in those days too. And I lost my sense of smell when I was 10 Mm -hmm. and, but I, but I got it back when I was 30. So, so you had lost your sense of smell for 20 years. Yeah, more or less. Yes. Well, that must have been amazing when you can really taste food again. Yeah. And, uh, but everything is. Well, when, when everything was coming back at the same time, it was a, yeah, it was like a shock to the system. Just like your senses, the psychological and the physical at the same time. Yeah. You, well, can you imagine if you are suddenly having a super hearing and light sensitive and you are su- suddenly having the sense of smell back and right. everything is like super too much? Well, was there a connection do you know do you know at all if there was a connection directly between the first experience and the second experience? Well, they were the same same creatures that were doing it. Mhm. That's the only thing I know. Okay. And so after this after you remembered more about the experience, do you do you feel like you were given some sort of purpose at all for for them choosing you? Well, for me, it has been more like, uh, how to say it, uh, normally you must, a lot of people are talking about bloodlines. I don't believe in bloodlines. Mm. I believe more like they are following you from past lives, etc. Because uh, when you are thinking about the, um, let's say, are just our universe, a lot of people, they are very focused on now that we have been coming from the Pleiades or Arcturus or few other places. But the thing is that just in our universe alone, there are trillions with galaxies and even more with Earth looking like places that or places that we can come from and live. Mm. And when you also think about our soul as an, as an internal, we have been everywhere. So, of course, I also have been one of the greys, so on the small greys, tall greys, or from the Pleiades or from on all kind of other planets all over yeah. in the past. So, for me, I think that they are more following you if you have been doing something that they needed or something important in the past life, they're following you in this life too. And it's not, not a big deal. Are, is it normal in the, ga- in the galaxy maybe or the universe, I don't know, that these more evolved sentient be- beings are bipedal, two-legged, two arms? Yeah, they're two arms, two legs. They're very much of, of the same same carbon construction as we are. Yeah. Is that because there's a, um, a, a progenitor species or that's just how DNA tends to evolve towards? Uh, and I, I must remind you that English is not my first language. So I, the, the first word you said, I did not recognize. Is there a, an origin species? One that seeded maybe other planets and we all came from that okay. season. And that's why we're the same? Or is it nature? I think it's just nature. It's just nature. Interesting. Yeah. So there's a coding uh, built into DNA and the, the organic molecules that make DNA just, just lean in that direction. I, I think that we evolve after the circumstances. Uh-huh. Because sometimes I think it would be useful to have four arms. <laughs> so we can multitask even more? <laughs> yeah. I, I, there's a lot of things about our evolution that I think we could we could make some changes here. <laughs> yeah, and the tail. Yeah, well, and with, yeah. Our, with our brains sometimes too, but maybe that's part of it. Are we still are we still evolving consciously or, or, or our brains physically? We are always evolving. Mm-hmm. And that's that's not only for us, that's for any kind of species. We will always evolve. It just goes on and on and on. Yeah. Did they 
tell you that, or is that something that you've just in, instinctually inferred from your experiences? And no, this come from my downloads. That has been starting to happen many, many years later. Yeah, was that around when you were thirty after the hypnosis? Uh, that actually started to, started before. Oh, um, what what age was that? Uh, let me see, around twenty five or something. Okay, interesting. So why. it was sort of leading right up to to that hypnosis. I wonder. I wonder if it was sort of suggesting to you, hey, it's time for for you to know the truth. No, um, actually, the, the, as you mentioned, I was going to this trip to the Gold Mountain where I had my cl- last close encounter. Right. right. Um, I was supposed to be up there for two months working on my book, but uh, well, I stayed there for one week. <laughs> that was the quickest holiday ever. Uh, I was very alone up there, but there was almost 20 kilometers to the next house or other persons, and I don't didn't even have a car. Well, you know, I can, just can, can, yeah. let's hold it right there because we're at the first break. Um, so when we come back on the other side, we'll continue the story of the Gold Mountain. And um, well, there's so much more to cover on the other side. Alan B. Smith for Power Normal Now on KGRA Radio. You definitely don't want to miss this. Hang in there. We'll be right back. Radio.com. Welcome back to Paranormal Now. This is Alan B. Smith, your grateful host, live on KGRA Radio every Tuesday, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you for listening to this show. And KGRA Radio has so many fantastic shows that you can tune in to, including Sky Tour Radio with Mark D'Antonio, Behind the Obsidian Curtain with Carol Carl, and so many more Taking us out of the break was music by Septembrio. If you want to find out more about them, just go to septembrio.com. All right, Kit. So we left it at Goal Mountain. Can you tell us about that that occurrence? Yeah. Uh, as I said, that I was going to this Goal Mountain. I was supposed to be there for two months working on my book. And um, suddenly it became a little shorter than I was thinking about. Um I was staying there for a week. I was in, in the, the good thing with, the, with this cabin, it was that it was 20 kilometers to the next people or the store or anything like that. So it was so quiet that you could actually hear the quietness. So it was actually absolutely stunning, beautiful mm-hmm. place. But um, then I was waking one morning and uh, first my, my first reaction was perhaps I'm getting sick or something because my nose was sore and... I had this like this gray greenish dried liquid from my eyes and from my nose. Whoa. But but when I was looking at myself in the mirror, then I'm seeing these very uh, sharp marks after like something that has been, let's say that something is putting a helmet on your head and you're having these marks after something metal, like a grip over your eyelid and your eyes. So it was very, this was not a pillow mark. I could see absolutely big difference on it. So, of course, I was wondering what, what was this all about. But the, the thing is that when you are staying in a cabin all, all alone and you have to do the fire, you have to make the food, you have to do all kinds of things actually to be, just to be alive up there. So it, then it got, comes a little bit more in the background during the day. But when the evening was coming then I, and the dark came, I was like a stressed animal in a cage because my body told me that something had happened, but I could not remember what, what it was. So I, I think I was reading the same magazine perhaps 20 times the next night. I could not sleep. I didn't want to sleep. And in the next day, I was 
lucky to connect with those people that was owning this cabin and they were they were telling me okay we can come later and pick you up so i packed everything that i had in my cabin and i, and I was waiting i waiting and waiting and the hours were so long and trust me when you are staying in a place that they are that quiet and then suddenly two big guys are stepping into the veranda and they are talking at the same time i guess i was almost upside under the roof in just in shock <coughs> so um that, that 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 scared me but um they picked me up and brought me back down to the society and when i came back down there i w- i was in for a little surprise uh what is the most normal thing that we are doing if we have been staying out in a place without without electricity for a little while that that's of course charging our phones mm-hmm. and when i was putting my mobile phone my mobile charger into the wall it sounded like uh, you know when a microphone when the, that one screams yes. everyone knows how terrible that sound is mm-hmm. that because- was the sound that was the sound of my charger so uh, and and every light bulbs that were in the house or any if they were trying to play some music, you could even hear the little tiny components that were inside the player. That the tick, 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 tick. Mm-hmm. there were all kind of sounds from everywhere. And when everyone was talking, it was too loud. So I had to put, I had to walk around with cotton balls in my ears to get the sound down as much as possible. So it, it was and terrible. Everyone was talking loud. Everyone was talking loud. Yes. And you just, was it like electricity kind of running through you? No, but so, I could hear, but I could hear the electricity. Uh huh. So it, it was just too much. And then my boyfriend, he was the leader of the UFO Norway. And uh, he came up to the, this place and picked me up and drove me back to, back to where we were living. And normally I was using this perfume because he bought it to me and he liked it very much. I, for myself, almost never had had the sense of smell of, of it at all. And now I was putting it on, walked in, out to his office just to turn around and walk inside again to wash it off because it was just too much. So um, all the senses were super high. Yeah. And did it affect you psychologically? Well, it was a struggle because it, it wasn't that easy to be outside together with other people because everyone was talking too loud you can't you could not go in a cinema because there's the sound of there would be too much absolutely too much and uh, going down for a pizza going some places where people are talking is too much even today it can feel too much so you're you're still hypersensitive today yeah i am but not not that much not that bad but still i can still have people coming over to my house and they can wondering why I don't have any sound on my television. And I said, yes, I do. But for them, it's very low. Right, right. Interesting. Is that because, do you think you adapted um, mentally to this, the this, this physical hypersensitivity so that you were able to sort of tolerate it better? Um, or were you able to sort of control it? For me, I'm not sure if I actually controlled it or things like that. For me, it's felt more like that it became more relaxed. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, yeah. Not sure how to explain that, actually, but it's not that bad. It doesn't feel that bad anymore as it used to be. Right. When it uh, Shortly afterwards, did you think that it was these beings again, or did you have any inclination as to what happened? Well, the thing is that since I felt something had happened, then... Through UFO Norway, they they had this connection with this hypnotherapist guy in Oslo. So we went in there to go under a regression to find out what happened. Mm-hmm. And the thing that happened was that I was in my in the cabin. I was going to bed for the night, and then suddenly my bedroom was full of light. And in the door, there was this not the small gray, but the tall gray. Mm-hmm. And uh, normally, when I've been, I have been drawing a picture of him. So. If that picture of him was supposed to be correct, then you had to turn it into like a negative because it was like the whole creature was shining. It was glowing. Uh So it was very beautiful. And um, then I was following this creature into the living room and there was three others there. They were the small ones. And then they were putting this kind of like a helmet thing on my head. 
yeah. they had this helmet thing had this like this like this arms that was going on the side down to the in front of your face and you had this like this kind of fork things that were on it and also these needles that were supposed to go into your ears for me it it, it, it sounded more like a bad horror movie from the 70s but uh, that's what it that's what it was so and then, then i could also see this grip thing on the helmet that was stuck on my head because it was very important that the, this helmet was stuck completely so so i was not moving uh huh what, was it painful? Well, the thing is that in that moment, when they started doing this, I remember remembered what happened to me when I was 10 years old. And from that moment, I told them, please don't let me remember anything more. And from that moment on, everything turned gray. And the hypnotist guy, he was working on me for two hours and tried to break through the gray area, but he couldn't. The only thing that he managed to do was giving me a bad headache. <laughs> I can imagine. Um now, the hypnotist, did, did you trust him? Did you feel like he was a responsible? Yeah. Uh, when it comes to the UFO Norway, they just want to work with hypnotist persons that are that that know what they are doing. And it's very it's also very important that they are not asking any kind of leading questions. Right. It's right. you that are supposed to tell a story. They are not going to put anything in there. And this gray area has it forever remained gray. Yeah, that has always been gray. But for me, it's not necessary to remember anything more anyway. So Sure, sure. You, do you know in life when you you have just like a vague, very, very vague memory of either a time period or something where it's not a memory per se with details and action, but more of like an emotional impression? Did what's What was your emotional impression of that well for me it has been i guess that they ha- it has been coloring me a lot since since my first experience mm-hmm. that uh, for me some people perhaps say that or she is just naive or things like that but you know what i think that it's very natural for us to be afraid if we are experiencing something that we don't understand but it's not the same that that the thing that we are experiencing that 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 thing is something bad if, if if I shall let's say let's say if I, if I take you and I was taking you to a dentist hour and you had never seen a dentist before mm-hmm. never been to a dentist before and of course you would be terrified but that dentist was actually just being helping you right right now there is see this is I, I ask a lot of people this and and I think we all we all ask this question when it comes to abduction cases is that is it akin to when humans we go out and we we're studying biology we're studying um the health of a species within their environment so we go out we capture them we tag them and we release them for them in that moment it could be a a shocking or traumatic experience right Um, yeah can compare it with that too not just the dentist Right, and so, and we're 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 trying to do something good on their behalf, but but they don't know that. No, they don't. So they will be terrified. So it, it's a natural thing to be terrified. But for me, I think I've been quite more relaxed because I have always had the feeling that they have never been doing anything to harm me. Yeah, but the difference, I think, let, let's say, I walked up to, um, you know, some endangered species. And I said, hey, polar bear, this is what we're <laughs> going to do, and it's for your own good. It, it, it just, there's no way that communication will work, right? <laughs> Isn't there a certain point on the sentient scale where no matter how high up you are, you're still able to communicate with somebody lower than you? Meaning, as human beings, aren't we at least high enough on the scale that these more evolved, assuming alleged evolved beings would be able to to come to us and have a conversation and say hey this is what we're doing this is why we're doing it this is for your benefit rather than just you know snatching us and uh, <laughs> doing their thing well it sounds bad when you're just saying snatching us uh, of course okay. a lot of people that's, that's can helpful. Helpful. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah a, a lot of people can feel it that way because if, if they don't remember much that's the way it will feel like 
And of course, I guess they also have their reasons for why they are not letting you remember everything because I've, I've, <laughs> things like this takes takes a long life to uh, how to explain it. Um, if you're just experiencing this just once, then you can be, of course, super afraid and don't understand it. But if you have been experiencing this on and off a lot in your entire life, then you're seeing it differently. And, um, of course, I can also be as scared if I don't remember but feel that something had happened. Mm -hmm. But um, when I do find out that was going on, I'm not afraid of it because, as I said, they have never done anything to hurt me. There was one taller being this time that you said was glowing, right? Yeah. That was not existent in your previous two encounters. No. Not what I remember, no. Did the little ones, did they glow at all? No, they were just like like us, normal. Okay. They did not even have a halo. <laughs> <laughs> no angelic halo. No. Oh. So they were, they were, do you think that they were just following the orders of this being or, uh, you, you know, rank and file or were they, um, I think that they were working together in what, what order they had. I don't know, but, uh, for me, it felt like a com communication and working together. Okay. Well, cause earlier you did mention that there, you know, could be multiple species, right? Um, absolutely. And so how, how many d could possibly be? collaborating or working separately from each other and studying us human beings? I have no idea. But a lot? Absolutely. Why not? If we had the chance to fly all, all over different places, mm -hmm. we would do the same thing. Oh, no, you're absolutely right. Yeah, that's exactly and and, 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 and and we don't even need to go there. How many speeches are, are there on this earth that we are looking over? Working with, dealing with, and that, is that what they're That's doing? A lot. They're they're actually looking over us. Well, I don't think that they actually are looking over us. I think that it's, it's very much the same thing that we are looking over the animals, so they're looking over us, and they're interested in us and not interested in us. They're for me, they are just like they are just like us. They are bad bad people of them, and they are good good parts of them and they are evolving and they also have things to learn the same thing as we do. So they're treating us like a curiosity sort of. Yeah, I think both. Hmm. But, uh, but as I said, as I also said that if you are following you for me, I have felt that they have been following me from my previous life. So, um, I think that I will know when I'm leaving this life, I will know even, know even more what, what all the purpose was this time, why they have been following me, why they did all the things that they did, and yeah, okay. there will always be, there will always come an answer sooner or later. You believe in reincarnation? Absolutely. Is is that something that is literally in, infinite? Is that what you think? Yes, I think that we have been, as a consciousness, we have been on and off forever. Right, and is there an apex? Is there is there a source? Is there a final resting place for us? Well, there is a source. There is there's a consciousness, but a resting place. Well, if people are think about heaven as a resting place, and I, I don't think it, I don't think about heaven. For me, it's just a consciousness, and it's the, ourselves as a consciousness that choosing to come forward, to experiencing things, and to to evolve, to expand. Right. I one of my favorite depictions of what the afterlife or heaven could be is um oh God, the name just slipped for me it was a movie with robin williams in the late 90s what dreams may come and essentially it's it's whatever your consciousness brings to the afterlife you sort of manifest the a world around you of the things that are that are beautiful um and you you interact with those that you've had relationships with and that sort of thing. But I guess that would be like, we are individual souls, but if, if we're returning to a source as it were, is there, are we individual souls or are we just drops in a, in a pond of water? We are like a drop in the bigger consciousness. 
we are a part of the bigger consciousness, but we are still us too. So yeah. we, we, we are both. So many abductees come back and, and we've known this all the way going all the way back to the fifties, whether however many of those cases were actually uh, legitimate or not, that these ETs come and say, Hey, we have a problem with you guys. You need to get your act together. Or they come with some metaphysical message. Do you, do you believe when you hear those stories that, that that's actually happening based on your own experience? Well, for me, I don't think that they are here to save us or they are here to help us with technology and things like that. For When it comes to saving our Earth, we had the technology long, long time ago already. But as you know, what happens? We do have the technology, but nothing is happening because of the money issue, the pharmacy, the big factories, the yeah. big money people and all of that. So, um, well, nothing is happening. And uh, if they were coming down and saying, okay, we have the solution for you, you can use this and this technology, and then you will save the planet. Would we use that technology? I don't think that we will be using that technology more than the things that we already have, because we, we will still have the money issue on this planet. So uh, our monetary ecosystem is is rotten. And so no matter what you inject into it, just... Uh, dilapidates it doesn't it doesn't work to its to its full potential no and i also think that now we are having a war amongst, amongst each other mm-hmm. and i think that if they were coming down in full size I, then we will be they will be met with people that will love them and open open arms and you will have people that will fight them so there will be the war continuing yeah but we do do good things though right yeah we do so i don't know i guess i would imagine that if uh, let's just say Elon Musk or you know some some other uh, enterprise did come out and say, "Hey, I'm going to give this technology free for everybody. This is zero point energy, and we can finally be free of the oil industry and fossil fuels and coal and all that stuff." Don't you think that if if someone gave that for out for free? that there would be enough ingenuity amongst us individually in our garages in our local businesses whatever to to you know to proliferate that and and actually um evolve in that regard well the thing is that there is a there has been a few people through history like nikola tesla mm-hmm. um that wants to yeah he makes the all these kind of inventions that wants to give the electricity and the power for free to the people but then you can see how he has been redrawn from the history books and how they have been working against him because he wanted to give it for free because the, mm-hmm. the money power is too big. Well, not too long ago, the FBI released some of their, their files on him. And I, I do wonder if they're still holding back. Absolutely. I can't imagine that they are giving out, putting out everything. Absolutely not. Yeah, you see, a, a lot of people all over the world are more interested now than ever mm-hmm. to find out how they can produce their own electricity. And a lot of people are do finding, they do find good solutions that can power up small villages, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then suddenly they are become quiet. Why, why, why does that happen? And that happens again and again and again. And then there are other corporations or people that are threatening them, so they actually had to have to go go quiet. Well, I can definitely believe that a number of people would succumb to the threat uh, of physical violence or harm to their loved ones <laughs> and that sort of thing. Uh, n- there might be someone who's courageous enough to say, I don't care. Uh, but it's true, I think, that there's an insidious uh, corporations and companies that probably meet with these people, go under the guise of a different face and um, manipulate them and buy out their um, their patents and that sort of thing. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on. I know one thing for sure that uh, yeah. I'm going to, I'm having this huge house here in Norway now, but I'm going to downsize, I'm going to sell it, and in the next place I'm going to make my own um, electricity and we're using magnetics and, and things like that because I'm so sick and tired of the electric 
companies here that are yeah they're almost ruining you because you have to pay a lot of money to even get the power for the power lines mm-hmm. and you have to pay pay for the power and if you refuse to have the smart meters you have to pay extra fine for having that i'm actually paying 500 pounds a year just because i don't want to have two smart meters in my house so i refuse to continue following this this thing that they are doing so i'm going to make my own power be self-sufficient in my next house so you'll be off the grid absolutely i'm so looking forward to it well and it's interesting that you brought up magnetism because i do want to talk about the physical evidence that is very much a part of your whole being um that magnetism plays a key role in your discovery of this evidence for your i guess abduction right for lack of a a better word so yeah. we'll talk about that evidence when we get back on the other side. And of course, I'm, I'm curious to hear what your magnetic uh, solutions might be. And thank you again for hanging out with us tonight. I know it's it's really late in Norway. Um, are we? It's about three o'clock there, three a.m. Right? Three o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks <laughs> so much for hanging. We've got one more hour to go. Everyone out there, thank you for tuning in. We're going to take this really quick break, and we'll be right back with more. This is Al B. Smith for Paranormal Now. Hang in there. Starting to let go. Gone too far the wrong way. This is Paranormal Now. Can take it all back now. Been lost in a bad way. I've got to let you go. Welcome back to Paranormal Now. This is Alan B. Smith, your host. Don't forget, in the second half of this hour, we will open the Paranormal Radio app lines for you to call in and ask our guests your questions. The number is 855-472-5483. The Paranormal Radio app hotline is 85-KGRA-LIVE. So when we give you the cue... Call in, stand by, and we'll get you on the air. So, Kit, what is this? Yeah. What is the magnetic uh, technology you're you're looking at using to be off the grid? Well, it's difficult to explain that in English. I just having this uh, diffuse pictures in my head um, about how I will make them. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, I, I will ask other people too to help me out with different kind of the engines and parts like that. But I, I, I'm going to get there. Okay. So you have you already have sort of a, a rough schematic in your in your head or on paper that you're working with. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I drew this for many many years ago, and they're stuck somewhere in my papers. It's not been the, those that I, I have been focusing on. Mm-hmm. And I'll, if, I'll, I'll, I'll do that when I when I'm getting to my next house because then it will be serious. Yeah, yeah. Then yeah, the in, the investment is is worth it. If you do if you do crack that, will, will you share that information with others? Yeah, absolutely. That's fantastic. Well, I, I look forward to hearing more about that. Now, as far as the evidence goes for your abduction, can you tell us about how you discovered these? implants in in your body uh, that was actually by um, a mis- not a mistake um, sorry I had a cat here that was jumping all over dipping my tea over my phone here oh, okay. <laughs> <I> was, <laughs> a little occupied <laughs> um, I always want you to know that they're more important yeah uh, no, I had a for many years, I was just joking about perhaps I have implants, perhaps I don't, because I, I have heard about a lot of people that have had implants. And um, then a friend of mine, Sid Goldberg, he was uh, working with cases that had implants. So he told me that, why, why don't you buy one of those 
ma near the new magnets, small magnets, and try to see see if they sticks on your neck because I had this triangle shaped thing on my neck, and uh, of course going around and joking about it is a it's it's a huge step from doing that till buying them and then you're putting them on and then they actually stick. It's like wow. <laughs> Okay, yay! <laughs> what do we do now? But uh, the thing is that I had a good friend of mine over for a visit, and he said that you know what, your nose has been more or less closed since you were ten years old. Why don't you try it on your nose too? So we did, and of course, it stuck there too. Your nose? On my nose, yes. And the thing is that it's very important if you are going to try the same thing uh, is that your skin sh must be as a neutral as possible, not too warm, not too cold, um, clean as possible. So, um, yeah, as I said, as neutral as possible. That's very important. So uh, then we went on a little research party on me, and then we find out that I have now up to almost around 30 implants, and they are symmetrical placed all over. 30 implants. And you've been able to hang a magnet on each of them or yeah it has to be exact on the spot because if there's much as, as a half centimeters on on the side the magnets will fall off right because I, I mean honestly if i put a magnet on anywhere in my body it's it's just not gonna stick even if my body is is thermo neutral <laughs> <laughs> most of the people so it will not stick no so yeah it was a surprise so i found out that i had on both sides of my third eye, both sides of, of my nose, nose, and both sides on the outside from the side of my eyes, both sides of my neck, five in the front of my chest, um, and then all the way down my spine, and then in my lower back. And now also later we found out that this will also go down in the front. So it's a lot. Do you have any idea when these implants were implanted? I don't know, but I, my feeling tells me that they came there when I when I had the last one. It just seems excessive, right? Because in most cases, it's one, maybe two uh, suspected implants. Yeah, that's the, that's what I have seen too. That most of the time is normally one or two or three randomly placed. Yeah, yeah. So when so when people ask me why don't you want to remove them, and I said no, I don't. Because they are symmetrical placed and they are there for a reason. Right, and that, that's the thing, is because they're symmetrically placed, that it's clearly not something that happened by accident. It's not a piece of, of metal that got stuck under your skin. No. And did you get a scan or x-rays or something? To yeah. Did, when I was discovering that I, that I had this implants, it was in January 2016. So it was a long gap from I was 30 till that, that year. And uh, a few months later, also through you for Norway, he had a friend of him that was a chiropractor, and he has this own x-ray machine. And, of course, here in Norway, it is like that, that you, you can't just walk up to your doctor and say, hey, I think I have some implants, can we take some x-rays? Okay. They will more likely get the people with white frocks instead and um, put you in somewhere and lock and throw the key. So uh, they were sneaking me up in the back through the back door. They did not even put my name on their schedule. Mm. So um, they sneaked me in there, took the pictures, and fast in and fast out. And you had the pictures. I have the pictures. Yes. Uh, so now, they can. Yeah. No. Are you? Are, do you share those with people at all? Well, I have them in my book, and you can also see them on my homepage. Okay. All right. So, yeah, I think a lot of us, we wouldn't know how to read um, those scans. But if you were to, you travel. So when you go through an airport, uh, does it ever trigger any kind of scan? <laughs> Everyone is asking me that question. <laughs> it's like, it's like, um, you know. Common sense question, right? Because it's like it's an everyday thing that, like, if I go through an airport and there's like a little penny in my pocket, you know, the thing goes off. Yeah. Now, most of the time, it does not 
doesn't affect it. But sometimes I can wonder because I'll, I know I don't have any kind of metal on me, but it is, mm. uh, this thing still says ding, ding, ding up there. So God knows. But but the thing is that they are so tiny. Yeah, They're really, really tiny. So these tiny things are uh, have a magnetic force just strong enough uh, that you can, you know, uh, magnet that uh, put a magnet to it and it will stay, but not not so large a piece of metal that it would trigger a metal detector per se. Because I, I don't know, do metal detectors do they detect magnetism at all or just just metal? Just just the magnets. No, like a metal detector. Is it is does it will it pick up magnetism or does it only bounce off of metal and give a signal in regard to Well, I haven't tried. There there has also been talking about perhaps trying to see if they can emit some radio signals or things like that, but uh, still we have just been talking about it. We have not got that far yet. So there's 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 still a lot of questions. Yeah, yeah, I would be very careful with that, right? Because you're sort of experimenting on yourself, if that's the case. Wouldn't you be concerned about, you know, using radio waves or what have you to see what happens? I must I must admit that I haven't been thinking about it that much. Oh, <laughs> I'm I'm quite relaxed to the whole thing. Yeah. So great. yeah. Yeah, and maybe that's just kind of who you are, right? Just built into who you are as a person, because that's that was your same sentiment earlier about about your first abduction. Yeah, I am I am quite relaxed to most of it. Um, I'm actually quite lazy. I have friends of mine that tells me that if they were able to do the same thing. They would be all over the place and looking for all kinds of things all the time, but I'm not. I'm take it more like as as as, as it goes. Mm-hmm. Like for example, for example, from I was thirty, that happened in eighty nine. No, ninety nine, ninety eight. I mean, ninety eight, ninety nine, mm-hmm. and then it was actually two thousand sixteen that I I actually discovered that I had implants. So yeah. Yeah. It goes slow, but we are getting there. Will they come back, do you think? Did they leave any sort of residual messaging for you or clue that they would do that? I have no idea. And th- and that doesn't scare you? Yeah. No, that does not scare me, no. I have seen them, seen them plenty of times uh, flying around in the sky or been communicating to me very clearly sometimes and then they uh, yeah when i have been re- actually bothered to react to what they have been saying and did what they were saying then they were actually dancing around in the sky big time so uh, i i had this experience when i was visiting my friend in in Tunsberg, and we were sitting and talking about these topics like this and uh, it was of course late at night before i decided that uh, okay it's time for me to go back home and when I came out on the doorstep and closing the door behind me, and I had this feeling that someone was watching me, and then I was thinking, ah, no, nah. it's just me that having that feeling because we have been talking about these things all night, so I, I didn't bother. But then I was starting driving my car back home, and I was coming up to the highway. There was this certain area there. There was no lights beside the road, so it was quite dark. And right before I was going to turn on the long lights of my car, I was getting this very clear message into my brain who says, turn off the light of the car. And before the reasonable self, me, could say that I can't do that because then I will not see anything, I did. Of course, I slowed down the speed of the car too. So I didn't drive fast and I turned off the light. And in the next moment, I had this huge light dancing over the... It was filling up the whole window of my car. Um... It was so bright and so clear. So when when it suddenly then disappeared again, it actually were you can see the prints on the sky where it has been, like if you are looking at a blitz or something like that. Mm-hmm. So that was just one of the times. How many sightings have you had? I don't know. I haven't counted. But multiple. Yeah. Is there a correlation between? abductees and ufo sightings in general no i don't think so you can you can you can be open-minded open-minded enough and uh, 
then you are more able to see them. Yeah. So when people talk about calling down UFOs, sort of uh, sending a message out there with their mind to invite them to appear, is is that a thing? Is that real? Well, I haven't tried it. You haven't? Um, no, I must honestly say I have not tried it. Interesting. Well, I, I, I guess that I guess that I did it when I was ten years old when I was trying that because I wanted them to come and pick me up. But beside that, I haven't. Right. I, I must actually say that um, a few years back I was up in Hestalen and we was a group there, and uh, the rest of the group they were out there in the cold in the field, freezing their butts off, and they were trying their best to get connected with someone out there. I was the only one sitting by the fire in the cabin because I was saying, you know what? If they want me, they know where to get me. So I refused to leave the stove. And yeah, I wanted to keep nice and warm. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, a lot, a lot of people do have negative experiences from abductions. And they report it as in not being something um, they can relax into or accept uh, that they struggle with it. Mm. Are, are those different beings doing different things to those people or are those people just processing something different than you? The, to that question can be many answers. Uh, they can be different beings, of course. They can be, still be the same beings, but uh, you can have good and bad of those as the same as humans. Yeah. Uh, you can also be afraid and have a bad experience, experience of something you don't know what is going on and you are being afraid mm -hmm. and if you don't have the um say using the word background is not the right word for this either um when you have been working your entire life to figure out who you are the purpose and yeah trying to know yourself as good as possible then you are getting more relaxed you understand you understand your life and your connection with them in a much better meaning than if you don't Mm -hmm. So there's a there's a lot of answers to why to to how one experience can turn out to be good or bad or something in between. Right. I feel that as time passes, I am more comfortable not knowing the answers, and sometimes I feel like I'm getting a little bit closer to to understanding the nature of of, of reality and my place in it, but. I just know that I'll never really, really know. Um, I don't think in this lifetime, in this body, you know, however, whether there's a life afterwards or not. Um, but I'm, I, I, I think I sense the same thing from you that as time goes on, you sort of just become more and more comfortable with, with what you don't know. Yeah, I do. Uh, but the thing is that I don't have that much questions anymore. This, um, it's, it's actually weird mm -hmm. because this started to happen to me when I was around 25 years old. Um, can you imagine when you're around 25 or 30 years old, it doesn't matter how old you are, how many questions have you had in your entire life? That would be a lot of questions. Let's say that you suddenly you will be getting the answer to all those questions. That can take a, that can take a while. For me, it, for me, it lasted almost three months. I was walking around more or less like a zombie. It was like that I could see everything, everything or everyone around me, and I could interact with them in a normal way. But in the same time, I, it was like I had this transparent film. It, it looked like, let's say you're looking at the end of a movie, that yeah. you see the film is going down with the text or pictures or film on it. Mm -hmm. You did not look close to it, because, but, but you knew what was going on, and you were just seeing them going down and down and down and down all the time for almost three months. Yeah. And um, when those three months was over, it was like you sat there and you, you knew it all, but in the same time you didn't because it wasn't important anymore. It was like you were back to ground zero. I had an experience once where it felt like the universe was literally downloading information into my brain. It was so intense and so fast that I just, I couldn't handle it. Um, it was very emotional and uh, was a very, actually turned into a very negative experience for me. And then I don't remember anything from that experience. 
Uh, do do you think that our our brains are meant to to know to have all the answers? Absolutely, because our information is not stored in our brain. It's more or less like they are opening up, opening us up to receive the information, but the information is not stuck in our brains. They are stuck in the area around us, and the, the, all the information are there in the matrix or the consciousness anyway. Right. But the, I guess some amount of information is stored in the brain, right? Because aren't they able to um, take imagery of people's dreams now that they're they're actually able to sort of take pictures of what people are seeing yeah but they're not stored in our brains in that way uh in in the normal way there are this um oh sometimes there's a language barrier it's not always easy to try to explain um we are surrounded with this field Mm -hmm. that are around closest to us and there is where we are storing our the newest information or the information that from is from this life Mm -hmm. And we are bringing that with us when we are dying to the consciousness. But the consciousness also had received a part of it, but then it's been more integrated with the consciousness itself. So, um, so, so, so there is the information is there is just frequencies is not stored in like boxes or what you will call it in, in our brain as physical pictures. Yeah. Um, I know psychologists do say that or, maybe not psychologists per se, um, but experts on the brain have said that, you know, the way the brain works is it only stores what it needs to store. It doesn't store every and absolute detail because it would just be overwhelming and there's not enough space in the brain for that. And so I guess it's like, you know, when you have like a memory that just pops into your brain out of nowhere, and it's like where I totally forgot this thing even happened. Was that? Do you think those sort of memories are a part of that ether that that are in our super consciousness, if you were, uh, is is downloading that, or was it always just hidden in the back of the brain somewhere? Well, it is in the consciousness field that are around us mm-hmm. that don't, that are closest to us. That yeah. are still separate from from the from the other matrix or from the other consciousness. Right. It, it, it's difficult to explain because we are we are a part of it, but also uh, on the leading edge out from it too. Right. And if the if there's a field around of consciousness around the brain, which is measurable, right? The the, the brain and the heart has measurable fields. Yes. Is, does that support evidence, or have you experienced um, a psychic connection between people where you can you can share a feeling or, or a sensation or, or information? Absolutely. I'm doing that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> as a common friend of mine, Mark Antonio, when we have been working on a project, we are normally, I'm kind of thinking a thing and he is saying it, or the opposite, or we yeah. are finishing each other's sentences, or in the middle of the sentences, and saying that stop messing it inside my brain. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> having a lot of fun with that. Yeah, well, the, that happens with roommates, with friends, with relationships. Um, I think a lot of people can relate to that. We have, we have those moments. But yeah, we have to do. It's just that those moments seem to happen of their own accord. And I think when most people try to, to do it with intent purposefully, they, it just doesn't happen. Well, I think that they are doing it in the wrong way. Mm-hmm. I think that since they are trying, they are not that relaxed. They are not letting the nor- normal flow appear. And uh, yeah, you, you easily see yourself when you are connected with someone then. Things go easy. Yeah, yeah. So there's there's a certain amount of relaxation. Absolutely, because when you're trying to force it, you can't do it. Yeah, you said that you're naturally more relaxed. Do you do any form of additional meditation for yourself? No, I don't. I'm trying. uh, That's my plan. I'm going to start doing it 15, 20 minutes every day. But I'm still that on that place that I'm thinking about doing it, but I'm not doing it. (laughs) I will sooner or later. There are so much beneficial 
things going on by start doing it. So eventually I will. But I, I must say that I guess I have been a little bit spoiled since I've been able to experience a lot without not even been yeah needing to put myself in 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 any kind of meditation or trance or anything like that to to get it. Yeah, because I think most of us we're we're trying to find some some peace, right? We're trying to slow down and make sense of things and find that more calm center. Yeah, it's important. Absolutely important. And of course, the, but if you do, then it, it will be easier for them for most people to experience a lot more things and open more up. So, yeah. And when it comes to the body and the health, well, there's plenty of beneficial of doing the meditation. Right. Just be just being grounded, grounded in nature. That's the absolute best thing if you can do it. Oh, take your shoes off. Go out there, breathe, be in nature, empty your mind. Yeah, I think I think nature is is profoundly important. Um, but I think it is also one of those things where, if you have the intention to to ground to to commune, if you will, or or let yourself be breathed into nature, then. It can, it's effective, but I think that a lot of people just grow up around nature and sort of take it for granted, and and don't really have a relationship with it in a, in a spiritual sort of way. That's that's the often the problem, yes. And then, of course, there's those of us who live in a city um, where it's just not that easy. No, it's not for me. I know by myself for myself that I could never live in a city. It's just too much noise, too much, too much of everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had <laughs> we had met some people once, and we were having a conversation with them, and they were out in New Mexico uh, when we were out there, and uh, we were talking about you know where we were from, you know New York, and where they're from, and uh, as we're talking about where we're from, they're like, oh yeah, we could never you know visit the city, and we're thinking you know New York, and they're like, oh it's it's so overwhelming, too much stimulation, it's blah blah, and uh, and then. You know, then we got the clarification that, oh, no, they're talking about Albuquerque. And, you know, we laughed because it was, for us, Albuquerque is like a quiet town compared <laughs> to, to New York. Mm. Um, so we all, I guess, have our different levels of stimulation uh, that we can tolerate and or appreciate. I think that there's a lot to, lot to do with uh, how you, what you're getting used to, too. Mm. So, um, but for me, I, I don't want to get used to be living in New York or other places like that. For me, I can visit the place, but I could never live there. I, I need I need the, the ground and the trees and the birds singing and nice and relaxed, quiet around me. Yeah, yeah. Well, speaking of um, not being quiet, the Paranormal Radio app lines are open. So if you want to call in and ask it your questions, it's 855 472 Eight three eight five KGRA live. So call in. We'll get you queued up and and ready to go. Kate, okay, out of all the experiences that that you've had, and we, we've talked about quite a bit actually tonight so far. But what's your what is your general philosophy on the purpose of humanity, or or do we have? Are we just a part of evolution and nothing more? Now you're asking a big question. So are you sure you have time enough? <laughs> well, we can <clears throat> bites. Yeah. Well, expansion, of course, is important. And for me, humans, humans are just one species of the many kind of species. And since we have been living as all of them, mm -hmm. how, how to say it? Um, I think that hu humanity will be uh, as the same as all the other species. We will come and go in different shapes and forms again and again and again. So, um, well, I'm not that, um, how to say it, concerned about what will happen to the humans or mm -hmm. what we are here for, because we are here for for expanding, evolving. Yeah, yeah. And that 
is that it? I mean, is it is it is it towards something in purposeful love? I mean, no, that that's the thing that a lot of people are mistaking because we are all the time talking about oh, we should evolve to be just a hundred percent good people. Uh huh. But the thing is that the bad thing is the contrast. Mm-hmm. So if we don't have contrast, we will not evolve either. We need the contrast in our lives. So, and, and, uh, so let's say if something bad is happening, uh-huh. it's up to you how you react to it. And uh, even if, let's say that your life is getting better and better, you will still ex- be able to experience things that are bad and things that is going on. But your reaction to it has changed. Well, that makes me feel better about my own contrasts that I've created. Um, I think we all have made mistakes in life or done things that we regret uh, or things that have happened to us. Yeah, but, don't, but, 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 but that makes us learn. But we want to minimize that? No, the, the thing is that we are, let's, let's say if you're splitting yourself in half, one half of you is bad and the other half is good. Mm-hmm. And um, the thing is that you should be having your, you should be balanced, standing in the middle with one solid foot in both of them. You know what you can do in both directions. Mm-hmm. But when something something bad or something whatever is happening to you, you can make good choices when you are standing there. What what you will do? Yeah, and I'm... not be not being just affected emotionally. Let's say, let's say that for a good example is that let's say you are having a good day at work. You are coming home. And your partner is staying at home, and she is having she or her he is having a miserable day. You're going inside, and before you know it, you are in the same mood as that person. Then you are not having control about what is going on in your mind, and you are letting other people, other factors on the outside affect you very, very easily. And that is just necessarily need to be a partner. It can be someone at work, someone in the street, but whatever place you meet someone that is having a bad day or whatever, they can affect you in a way that you are copying them. You're actually mirroring them by not even having having nothing to say in your own mind. So the thing is that being to evolve is to be getting your consciousness clear in your mind. So you can be, you can be sympathetic for somebody without absorbing their, their bad state of mind. Absolutely. Because I think that can be tricky for 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 a lot of us. Yes, but in the same time, that they will also be an indicator of how easily they are for them to affect you, and how much control you actually are having of, over your own mind or over yourself at all. Right. All right. Well, we have two callers. We're going to go to the first call right now. So, Charles, you are on the air. Welcome to Paranormal Now. Hi, Alan. Great show. Great guest. Yeah. Thanks uh, for calling in. Hey. Kit, this is Charles Hello. from Ohio. How are you? I'm Good fine, thank you. you. How are you? Okay. Uh, when's your new book going to be out? Which book? My next book, The, the oh, Creation, your, your you next, mean? Your, your next book, yes. Yeah, yes. that will hopefully, if everything turns out in the right way, it will be this fall. I am so looking forward to reading that. I loved your other one. Okay, you had the first one. Glad you liked it. Uh, yes, indeed, I did. Yeah, we met at Pine Bush. I don't, I don't know if you recognize my voice or not. Well, the the connection here is a little bit bad, so I, I hear ah, your voice, okay. but I can't recognize it. This is, okay. If you said no, that I met at Pine Bush, Hill. then I know which Charles, so it's nice hearing you from you again. Hill. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I, 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 just had, I saw you were there. I just had to call. Um, yeah, Doc, so many questions, but I, I will say this. I absolutely agree with everything that Kit has said. Mm-hmm. It is, she's just a remarkably insightful person. And I Thank guess you. I'll let uh, the rest of the queue jump in and, and make a few comments. So Charles, thanks. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Kit. Man, always. All right. So thanks, Charles. Yeah. So your your book is cre- the creation where physics and consciousness meet. Yes. What what's your um well, what's your what's your end goal with that? 
Well, the thing is that when I was start talking about the downloads that I was getting, um, when I was like this, getting back to the ground zero, it for me it was like they were just preparing me for the things that would be coming later, and uh, that was actually a massive download with um, that they were actually showing me the big machine how everything was working, and they were actually dragging my consciousness out from my mind and outside of absolutely everything. It was like you were hanging out there and you were looking into the total of the machinery. You saw the the matter and the consciousness, everything at the same time before you then was dragged in again and then you were following all the systems all the way down, following the Big Bang and the whole thing that was happening afterwards, how the quarks was made, everything. And then you, before you knew it, you were back into the basement and voila. So, and everything that has been coming later has been like you are been taught how the different part of the engine works and how everything is working together. Yeah. So, so actually, I'm, I'm actually working now in the same way as Tesla was doing. He was doing it with the engines that he could see uh, engines like a, like a 3D in front of him and he could very easily take another mod, engine part, put it in, see how it works together or not, and he could dismiss it or use just parts of it. Right. I do the same thing, but with with the consciousness and with 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 the um, with the physics. Yeah, yeah, and that's kind of similar to how Einstein saw equations in his head in the sort of three D realm. Yeah. Uh, let's go to the second call, Ron. You are on the air. Hey, Alan, and hello to Ket. And hi uh, there. Good to good to hear both of you again, uh, Ket. I also met you. Uh, I me and Charles rode together actually. <laughs> From, from okay, I, also, I think I recognize um, your voice. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, I, I thank you for your uh, interview and great guest and great topic and great uh, conversation. Uh, like Charles had so many questions. I, I have about a dozen of them, but I'll keep it short to one. All right. You mentioned the gray matter, a gray area where you're not going to go into do you find yourself in a situation where you might need to go into that gray area to get your answers? <laughs> and if so, how is that going to affect your decision not to go there? Well, for me, it's not important to go there. For me, I felt like that I need that I n- knew enough what happened. I didn't need to, to know the whole process. It's like you are going to the dentist and uh, let's say you know what they are doing to begin with, but you don't absolutely feel that you are in the need to know the whole process that they are doing. Great answer. All right. Thank you. (laughs) And uh, have a great rest of your interview here and I hope to see you uh, soon again at some point, uh, maybe this year if you can get back over here. Perhaps I will. Time will show. Yeah, I think mine right. should be June this year. Yeah. There you go, yeah. Yep. I'll be there again. All right. Okay. See <laughs> Bye. See you again. Thanks. Bye. <coughs> so are you familiar? Do Are you a fan of Star Trek The Next Generation? I have been looking a little bit on it, but not that much, no. Well, there there's a character there. In the first episode of the first season, and then, you know, he was there throughout the seasons until until the last episode, and his name was Q. And Q was a part of a sort of conscious collective of super-evolved beings that were judging humanity and putting – he was putting Picard and the Enterprise through a sort of trial – and said, you have this much time, we're watching you, the decisions you make are crucial, because the human race historically has been a terrible species, and um, we're going to see if you guys should exist or not, and we will end you. And do you, do you think that, that that could be a reality in, in our galaxy, in our, in our universe? That there could be species out there that pass judgment on humans or others? Well, why not? We are doing it ourselves among ourselves, so why not? That's a good point. Yeah. I think that I think that we, we we don't need them to end our end us. We are 
capable to end ourselves a thousand times alone. So, yeah, I don't think that we need the help from the outside. And if it happens, it can happen that too. Just before you mentioned the machine in one of your downloads, can you can you describe that more? I was a little bit lost on what the machine is. Well, the it wasn't the I, I was comparing it with with a big machine, but it was not a machine. It was the um, well, I, I can start with the beginning of it. I was actually standing in my basement and I was working on a wedding dress for a friend of mine. Um, and I had a deadline, so trust me, the last thing I was thinking about that was physics. I was not even interested in physics or things like that at all. So, uh, well, I was standing there, and then I was starting to hear these numbers that were suddenly popping up, and I was thinking, okay, what are they for? Did not tell me much. And then they repeated itself a few times, and then I saw this, like this string of pearls, then another one turned up without the bindings. It looks like DNA, but of course without the bindings. And then it continued to grow up till it was like a 12 strings complex DNA. And then they would just keep on growing and growing and growing. And then it was something, it was like something was taking my consciousness outside of the backside of my brain and just shook me out. So I was like, I was hanging out there, out in nothingness. And I was looking into this thing that looks like a huge donut with pearls. And I could see this big light that were in the middle of it and also surrounding all of it. And I felt quite humble when I was hanging out there because I understood what this was. And this was the total. And then I was dragged in to one of the spheres and I could see something that looked like an atom with the electrons, but it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Because actually the atom and the electrons, they're actually copies of the bigger pictures. Yeah. So then I was following the process that was going on side in there because here there was the, the multiverse core and the multiverse is flying around and one of them was becoming our universe for the Big Bang and I was following the whole system that was going on after the Big Bang and yeah and ended up in our own solar system today and then back in the basement again. So trust me, I was not thinking about the wedding dress for the rest of that day or two. <laughs> so it, 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 it changed my life. Yeah, kind of overshadowed everything. Absolutely. Uh, the the ships that you were on, I'm, I'm assuming they were like some kind of like a spaceship, right? Wherever you were held. What did, what did they look like? Well, I must say, I don't remember much how they look like. Um, I have been into one that was I actually saw... I was in Bulgaria two years back. I had a lecture down there. And when we were flying back from Bulgaria, this, this was very, very early in the morning, and uh, the sun was starting to come up, so you can see the sun was over the clouds. And uh, most of the, I guess that most of the people on the plane, they were sleeping, but I was having my head close to the window because I always like to watch the nature, see the sun coming up, the clouds and all of that. And then I saw this uh, craft was coming, and I was thinking, hmm, no wings, no tails, no smoke behind, no windows, no doors. And someone would say, probably, okay, it's too far away. But it wasn't that far away. It was very, very close up. It was actually a little bit lower than our, our own plane. And I was also looking at the clouds, trying to s- compare the speed that our plane had above the clouds. And I was looking at that one that was going the opposite direction. And trust me, that one was not shy at all, and it was not going to try to hide or anything. It has a, the same speed, the same time, and just passing us a little bit underneath us. Mm-hmm. And I was looking at it all the time, and it was like a silver. Um, it was so shiny of silver that the sun was re- re- reflecting back from it. And as I said, there was no windows, no doors, nothing. Yeah. And it looked like a bread. It was flat in the bottom, and the rest of it, it was round, mm-hmm. smooth in the, in, the, in the shape. And a little later, I was mentally actually able to get in inside of that craft. And it was in- interesting to watch because the roof and everything, it, well, can, it, it would be the same impression as if you're putting your sunglasses on. You could see the sky, you can see everything around you, but it was like you are having this shell, like sunglasses. Yeah. 
and all the inst- and all the instruments they were like they were following the wall around around it and um I, yeah I, I did not see any kind of other creatures or anything like in there it was like it was empty but um why it was like that i don't i don't know but i was seeing the craft and but the thing is for me it felt like that they could actually do something so this shell disappeared or getting more uh, transparent interesting and and during the process then it was just only left left to the ring that are on the outside and i know that i have been seeing actually pictures taken of crafts that you can actually just see the ring J- just the ring of of the craft yeah so people are actually been able to take pictures of craft when they are just in, just capture the ring. Yeah. But I was standing on the inside and I was seeing what was happening when just the ring was left in this when it was when it was going from solid to more transparent. Mm-hmm. Well, I know that some cameras have seemingly caught uh, objects on camera that the person didn't didn't see. And cameras often can pick up the infrared spectrum, whereas the human eye, I can't. So I, I do wonder if there's some more sort of manipulation of, of light that's creating this effect. I don't know. Difficult to explain. Yeah, yeah. Even, but, even harder for me to do it in English, too. So <laughs> I'm trying my best. Are, are you, was that, I, I saw some of your, your talk on when you were in Bulgaria. Are you... Do you frequent Bulgaria, or is that was that a one-time trip? Uh, that was just a one-way trip, a uh, one-time trip so far. Hopefully, yeah. I'll be going back there later. Yeah, it's a beautiful country, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And yeah, everyone is really hospitable. At least if you're if you're a tourist visiting, they're hospitable. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Well, I guess I'm trying to wrap my head around the intention of these beings. And why they they chose you, and I, I I guess I still haven't haven't gotten it. Um, but I guess you don't you don't really know, do you? Well, I don't know the full answer. No, I don't. For me, I think I have a feeling that they have been. I for me, I think that the implants are there to help me to open up to receive more information easily. Uh, like a friend of mine that was joking that he said well, he was saying that the way that those magnets are placed, you are like a walking, talking radio antenna. And I was thinking, hmm, perhaps there is something in it. Perhaps, perhaps it's not. It's just me guessing. But um, for me, it would be a good, yeah, good explanation actually, because because of the things that I'm doing. Because I'm I'm when I'm working on my next book with the the creation. And I'm saying that I'm working on it. The thing is that uh, that I'm not working on it in the same ways that other people are working on the topic, because I'm not sitting there and twisting and turning my brain in and out and then figure out things can work in this way or that way. For me, I must leave myself out of the equation. For me, I, I need to work with science people that can talk about stuff and trigger something in my mind. And when they trigger something, then it will come new information I have a direct message question from Omara, and it is, do you feel the implants? No, I don't. I don't feel them. And do you think that they affect your character as you, you know, or seem to be so accepting of everything that's happened to you? No, I don't think that they have anything to do with that. I think that it has more to do with that I have been seeing them or meeting them my entire life and since I was a kid and of course I have been twisting and turning myself in and out many times to mm-hmm. yeah to, to figure out did I really experience this or doubt myself and but the thing is that I, I, I can't lie to myself with the things that I have been experiencing even if I was standing on my head or how, how you will say it so mm-hmm. I guess that through all those years with self-searching and working with yourself that makes me also feeling more comfortable in my own skin and to know what I'm dealing with. Yeah. Do you, um, this is another direct message question. Do you, do you have a sense of your own past lives? 
Absolutely. I remember several several of my past lives. Several. Do you, do you remember them clearly? And like a, like a place or time, or is it more of just a, a vague memory? No, several of them I remember quite well. And uh, one of them has actually been following me big time in this life. That was from Mongolia. And in 2017, I was actually that lucky that I was able to go back to Mongolia. Uh-huh. And uh, there was a lot of good things there that I was getting the answers answer to. Yeah. Huh, that's interesting that you're attracted because the in Bulgaria, the the Mongolian or you know Genghis Khan Empire, it, that was all part of it at one time as well. Yeah. Do you do you, do you ever get a sense when you're around certain people that that maybe you can relate to them through your your own past? Well, I can't say that I do. No, I haven't been that lucky. It happened to me once before where I'd met someone and I, I felt really strongly like like I I've I know this person, you know, maybe from a different lifetime, but some I just had that really strong feeling. Did you did you bring any attributes from these previous lives forward into this life at all? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh when it comes to the Mongolian thing, that's one is actually a little bit funny because <coughs> That one also started when I was around eight, nine years old. I was interested in art from China or that that area. I didn't read much, but I was looking at the pictures and I was very fascinated about it. And um, when I was around 10, 11, I was starting to draw fashion. And normally I was making this very short jacket with a fur around the arms but they were not right. And I also had this like a belt with the material in the front and the back, but they were also not right. Mm-hmm. And it took me a long time before I was actually putting them together. And then there was, yes, now they were it was the way it was supposed to be. And they were actually the Mongolian suit. Uh, when I was around 12 years old, I was desperate. I was, was so, I wanted so badly an eagle or a hawk. But yeah. of course, the eagle was, of course, the best thing. And in my desperation, I was getting two pigeons. <laughs> so I remember my mother, she was coming upstairs and she was going, she was passing my bedroom and she heard this from my bedroom. She was wondering, what? What has she done now? And she found the two pigeons in my bedroom. I was changing my closet into a big cage. And of course, we, we, we gave them back. Did and uh, Either yeah. or did you coax, coax them with seeds or something? What? Did you did you go to a pet store or did you bring them in with food and seeds? I, I no, I was getting uh, getting everything that I needed. Uh, I actually now I don't remember where I got them from. There was I think there was in a newspaper or something I could buy them from. Oh my gosh! So yeah, and there was a lot of other things too. And there was also this special song when I heard it on the radio on the TV or the radio later. Yeah, I was like I was I was out there in the fields, big fields. So um, there's a lot, lot of things going on, yes. But the thing is that I was, this was in, um, in the early 90s. Mm-hmm. I was out there driving with my boyfriend, and um, suddenly I was not sitting in the car anymore. I was sitting on a horse. Uh, I saw the beautiful, huge, <coughs> snowy landscape around me. And the, the, the mane of the horse was so clear, I couldn't even see the different colors of the mane. I saw the clothing that I wear. I knew how I looked like. And I also had this enormous f- good feeling that I was very soon be home to the person I loved because I haven't seen that person in a long time. I, I, I had been out there hunting. And in the next moment, I was back in the car again. And I was so super frustrated. I was so frustrated. I can't not even put the words to it, how bad it felt to be back in, in the car in this time because it was the wrong place. So uh, when I was going to Mongolia in 2017, I was getting so much of the answers to to all of my things. Um, The first thing is that we were driving out there in the desert and we had this guide with us. And I, I was sitting there looking out the window for six, eight hours straight and just Wow, the big sky and the nature, and it, it was just stunning. Yeah. And I told her, you know what? I hear a word tenger or tengeri in my head. There must be the word for big sky. And she was looking at me and she said, yes, that's true. That's right. And when I told her about this, the song that I knew now that was called The Long Song, uh, then she says that 
the feeling that I got that, that you are out there on the steps. That's 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 what they are singing. That's what they are singing about. That yeah, that that's so fascinating. I'm sure my my wife will correct me, but I believe Bulgarian sky god or thunder god is uh, Tangra, which is okay. very similar. Yeah, yeah, and um, and uh, I also I, through my life I've always had horses and I've been riding for other people too, but they have always been complaining about the way I'm riding. And uh, when I was getting down there, we were coming up to this Costco Lake, and of course there were horses there, and we, I, of course, I had to go out riding, mm-hmm. including with my guide and her boyfriend and the horse guy. And the first thing he did when he saw me as a tourist, and he was going to fix those, um, what's the name for it in English? Those that you're putting your foot in. I put your uh, um, stirrup. The thing, yeah, the thing that you you, you have the saddle, and you are having those that you're putting your feet in. Yeah. I don't remember the, the right name for it in, in English. But but when he saw me, then he was going to make them in a tourist way. And I looked at him, no, 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 in the Mongolian way, I said. And he was looking at me, okay, well, <laughs> so he did. And uh, I would put myself on the horse and I was thinking, okay, it's now or never. Just let the old inner Mongolian live free. And I did. And I had a splendid time. And then after a little while, I saw this, uh, my guide and my tourist guide and the other, they were talking about me and they were smiling and looking in my direction. And I was saying, okay, what's so funny? So I ride up to them and asked what, what's going on. And then she tells me that this horse guy, he tells us that this woman, she knows how to deal a horse or work a horse. And that's the best compliment I have ever had. That's fantastic. Kit, thank you so much for joining us tonight. In 30 seconds, if you could leave us with with one thought or one message that you'd like to share, what would it be? Wow. Um, just try to be yourself in good and the bad, and don't try to just go for one direction, but explore both sides of yourself and be balanced between them. Between the dark side and the light side? Of the, the dark side and the good side, yes. Okay. And because if you, if you are balanced, you will not be affected about things that is going on on the outside. All right, thanks. You are getting you are getting the control in your life. If you want to find out more about Kate Thorvaldson, just go to www.kateethorvaldsen.com. Yeah, been- uh, uh, and my ebook will be out there in uh, just a few days too. There you go. Perfect. All right, thanks. You've been listening to Paranormal Now, broadcasting live Tuesday, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard on KGRARadio.com, your official contact for the best in alternative talk radio. To find out more, go to KGRRadio.com slash Paranormal Now. Join us next week with guest David Halperin to discuss his new book, Intimate Alien. And yeah, he'll be challenging ufologists and making the argument, it's all just a myth. Stay tuned for Jimmy Church coming up next. And special thanks to KGRA producer Race Hobbs. Until next time, live in the mystery.